the Bible is filled with accounts of injustice and oppression throughout the history of God's people. The first such instance is found in just the fourth chapter of the Bible, Genesis chapter 4. There we are introduced to Adam and Eve's two sons, Cain and Abel. Abel was a keeper of the sheep. Cain was a worker of the ground. We're told that both of them brought offerings to the Lord, and the Lord accepted Abel and his offering, but had no regard for Cain and his offering. This, of course, infuriated Cain so much that he rose up against his brother and killed him. The tragic and unjust murder of Abel reminds us that injustice has existed in the world ever since Adam and Eve first rebelled against God in Eden. When I think about oppression in the Bible, my mind is immediately drawn to the slavery of God's people in Egypt in the opening pages of the book of Exodus. Joseph had brought his family to Egypt with the blessing of Pharaoh. But eventually, the Bible says that there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. This new king set out to oppress God's people by ruthlessly making them work as slaves. The Bible says that he made their lives bitter with hard service. Not only this, to control the population of Israelites in Egypt, the king instructed the Egyptian midwives to kill all the Jewish male babies. This new Pharaoh's treatment of God's people was truly horrific and oppressive. Of course, Israel's deliverance from oppression in Egypt is a major theme that shows up time after time throughout the Old Testament. Now, we could go on and on talking about instances of injustice and oppression throughout the Bible. Sometimes God's people were on the receiving end of injustice and oppression. And sometimes God's people were actually the perpetrators of injustice and oppression. The truth is that there has never been a time since the fall of mankind in Genesis 3 when there was no injustice and oppression on the earth. We see in Ecclesiastes that Solomon's day was no different. And this morning we are continuing our study of Ecclesiastes and we are in Ecclesiastes 3 and 4. We'll start in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 16, where we left off last week, and read through chapter 4, verse 3. So I encourage you to go ahead and turn there in your Bible if you haven't already. Uh, if you don't have your Bible with you, our text begins on page 519 in the Black Pew Bible in front of you. Also, if you haven't yet picked up one of the Ecclesiastes scripture journals, I encourage you to do so. Uh, they are available to you at no cost to you to help you with your note taking as we make our way through Ecclesiastes. So I'm going to read Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 3, beginning in verse 16. This is the word of God. Moreover, I saw under the sun that in the place of justice, even there was wickedness. And in the place of righteousness, even there was wickedness. I said in my heart, God will judge the righteous and the wicked. For there is a time for every matter and for every work. I said in my heart with regard to the children of man that God is testing them that they may see that they themselves are but beasts. For what happens to the children of man and what happens to the beast is the same. As one dies, so dies the other. They all have the same breath and man has no advantage over the beast for all is vanity. All go to one place. All are from the dust, and to dust all return. Who knows whether the spirit of man goes upward and the spirit of the beast goes down into the earth? So I saw that there is nothing better than that a man should rejoice in his work, for that is his lot. Who can bring him to see what will be after him? Again, I saw all the oppressions that are done under the sun, and behold, the tears of the oppressed. And they had no one to comfort them. On the side of their oppressors, there was power. And there was no one to comfort them. And I thought the dead, who are already dead, more fortunate than the living, who are still alive. But better than both is he who has not yet been, and has not seen the evil deeds that are done under the sun. Would you pray with me? 
Father, we thank you for your word this morning. And Father, we pray that you would help us. Uh, every time that we are able to come together as your people to worship you and to hear from your word, God, it is a privilege. And so God, I pray that you would help us, help me not to take this privilege lightly this morning. That we would devote ourselves to your word this morning, that you would give us ears to hear and eyes to see. And that you would use your word to make us more like Jesus and to set our hope in Christ. Help us, we pray, in Christ's name. Amen. In this passage of scripture, the preacher wrestles with two timeless questions concerning life under the sun. They are both questions that we all have to wrestle with at some point in our lives. I think we would like to have clear theological answers to these questions, but that's not what the preacher does here in Ecclesiastes 3 and 4. Instead, he gives us the opportunity and permission to ask these questions ourselves, because they are, in fact, questions that we have, and he helps us to wrestle with them. So here's the first question that the preacher raises. How do we live in an unjust world. How do we live in an unjust world? You see, the preacher wrestles with the reality of injustice. You see it there in verse 16. He says, moreover, I saw under the sun that in the place of justice, even there was wickedness. And in the place of righteousness, even there was wickedness. In the place where there should be justice, the preacher saw wickedness or injustice. And in the place where there should be righteousness, he found wickedness or unrighteousness. The preacher isn't more specific than this about where the place of justice is or where the, preacher, the place of righteousness is. Perhaps by place of justice, he means a court of law. Perhaps by place of righteousness, he's talking about the assembly of God's people or the temple. Regardless, it seems clear from Ecclesiastes 3 that what the preacher saw when he looked at the place of justice and the place of righteousness and instead saw wickedness, it was unsettling to him. Now, why do you think that the preacher was unsettled by the wickedness that he found in the place of justice and in the place of righteousness? Why? I think he must have expected or at least hoped for something different, right? He wasn't expecting to find wickedness or wasn't at least wasn't hoping to find wickedness in these places. I'm not terrified of snakes like my mom is, uh, but I'm not a big fan of them either. Uh, if I'm at a zoo or an aquarium, I don't mind going in the snake exhibit and uh, looking at all the snakes behind the glass, right? Uh, I'm even willing to touch a snake as long as someone else is holding it and controlling it. But if I find a snake on my front porch, when I'm taking off my shoes after cutting the grass, as I recently did, that's a completely different story. Because I'm not expecting that snake, right? It doesn't matter that it is a black snake. I don't, I don't want anything to do with a snake that isn't either contained or dead. A surprise snake is always unsettling. And when you think about a place of justice, you're not expecting wickedness there, right? When you think about a place of righteousness, you're not expecting wickedness there. And so when wickedness is what you find, it is unsettling to you. The preacher wrestles with the reality of injustice and he helps us wrestle with it too. You're familiar with the sculpture of Lady Justice. She's blindfolded to represent impartiality. She's holding a set of scales which represent fairness. And she's holding a sword, right? And the sword represents swift or final justice. And I like what one commentator wrote when he said about this passage here in Ecclesiastes. He says, but here in Ecclesiastes, the blindfold is off, the scales off balanced, and the sword stolen. There's wickedness in the place of justice. The reality is, brothers and sisters, that we live in an unjust world, don't we? 
No, we've all heard stories of people who bore the brunt of our criminal justice system only for it to be discovered years later that they were actually innocent. We know that there are also times when those who are guilty of doing heinous things get off with a slap on the wrist or no penalty at all. Sometimes it seems that having a good lawyer is more important than being innocent. But why does the preacher expect justice? Why does the preacher expect righteousness? I think it's because our God is a God of justice. Our God is a God of righteousness. And the truth is, brothers and sisters, that we are made in his image. Throughout the first three chapters of Ecclesiastes, we have been talking about the fact that things are not as they should be. We've been talking about the fact that this world is broken, that things are not as God created them to be. And the preacher is wrestling with that reality. But because we're made in the image of God, our hearts long for justice. Our hearts long for righteousness. And the preacher in Ecclesiastes is no different. The clearest example of this, I think, is the small child who instinctively knows when something isn't fair. It's not right. It's not just. The truth is, brothers and sisters, our hearts long for justice and righteousness, which leads to the preacher wrestling with the judgment of God. Look at verse 17. He says, I said in my heart, God will judge the righteous and the wicked, for there is a time for every matter and for every work. We can't find justice under the sun, not even in the place of justice. So brothers and sisters, where do we go? We must look above the sun. We must look to the heavens where God is. Abraham asked the Lord, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? The answer is yes. He will. He will do what is right. There is wickedness on the earth, but there is no wickedness with God. To remember the martyrs under the throne in Revelation 6 crying out for justice. And throughout the rest of the book, we see God bringing justice to earth. Solomon says that there is a time for every matter and for every work, including God's judgment. The wicked will not get away with their evil deeds. They, they may seem to for a while, but God will judge the righteous and the wicked. There's some debate among commentators about whether Solomon is talking about God's final judgment here or judgment that he executes in various ways now. In some sense, it doesn't matter. The truth is, brothers and sisters, that God always does what is right. Sometimes he brings judgment in this life, and the Bible is clear that he will certainly bring final judgment at the end of the age. After wrestling with the judgment of God, the preacher goes on to wrestle with the certainty of death. Look at verses 18 to 20. I said in my heart with regard to the children of man that God is testing them, that they may see that they themselves are but beasts. For what happens to the children of man and what happens to the beast is the same. As one dies, so dies the other. They all have the same breath, and man has no advantage over the beast, for all is vanity. All go to one place. All are from the dust, and to dust all return. Now understand that when he says beast, he's talking about animals. And this can be a little bit confusing because at least at first glance, it appears to contradict what we know from Scripture to be true concerning the dignity and worth of every human being. The, the, secular, evolu Please stop. the secular evolutionist says that, they are, that we are all a bunch of animals, that we're just more involved than other species. But the Bible teaches us that God created us in his image. We're set apart from the animals and we're given dominion over the animals. In Psalm 8, the psalmist asks, what is man that you are mindful of him? 
And the son of man that you care for him. And then the psalmist responds, yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, and the fish of the sea. Whatever passes along the paths of the seas. You see, as the pinnacle of God's creation, mankind is obviously more valuable than the animals. But that's not what Solomon is talking about here. Solomon is saying that just like the animals die, humans die too. And if this life is all that there is, brothers and sisters, then our fate is the same as the animals. We have no advantage over the animals for all is vanity. We've been talking a lot about death in the book of Ecclesiastes, haven't we? Last week we saw that there is a time to die. We saw the reality that death is coming for every single one of us. Some of us sooner than others. None of us really know how much time we have left in this life, do we? But one thing is certain. We will all die. All go to one place, Solomon writes. All are from the dust, and to dust all return. The preacher wrestles with the certainty of death. But the preacher also wrestles with the uncertainty of eternity. Look at verse 21. Who knows whether the spirit of man goes upward and the spirit of the beast goes down into the earth. This may feel troubling at first, but don't, don't overthink what Solomon is saying here. But think about it this way. Have, have you ever buried an animal? Maybe a pet? What did you see? You saw an animal being buried in the ground, right? Usually at funerals, we don't lower the body down into the grave during the graveside service. That happens after the service. But maybe some of you have stuck along after and you've watched as the casket was lowered down into the ground. What did you see? A person being buried in the ground. You didn't see their spirit go upward. That's what Solomon is saying. Who knows? A burial looks like a burial. Whether it's an animal or a person. So at worst, Solomon takes an agnostic approach to the possibility of life after death. But biblical scholar Walt Kaiser suggests that Solomon isn't actually asking a question in verse 21 at all. Kaiser says that Solomon is actually making a distinction between animals and people. That animals go down to the earth, but the spirit of man goes upward. Either way, as followers of Jesus... We know that we can have certainty concerning what will happen to us after death. The Bible is clear. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. The apostle Paul writes in Romans 10, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. We saw in our study of Revelation that you either follow the Lamb or you follow the beast. Follow the Lamb and God promises you eternity with Him in a new heaven and a new earth. Follow the beast and God promises you eternity separated from Him in the lake of fire. We don't have to wonder what happens when we die. God has clearly revealed it to us in his word. You can have certainty that if you are in Christ, you will spend eternity with God. This is good news for us. Because so many people struggle with assurance of salvation. I often have people share with me that they don't know what will happen to them when they die. Almost as if it's impossible to know. It's not impossible to know. Cling to Jesus in faith. And eternity in heaven awaits. But refuse to trust in Jesus and eternity in hell awaits. Friends, it really is that simple. As chapter 3 comes to an end, we see that the preacher wrestles with the goodness of work. 
Verse 22, he says, So I saw that there is nothing better than that a man should rejoice in his work, for that is his lot. Who can bring him to see what will be after him? We live in a broken world filled with injustice. All will die. God will judge the righteous and the wicked. Our eternity will be determined by what we do with Jesus in this life. But how are we supposed to live now? Solomon says, work hard and rejoice in our work. You see, brothers and sisters, life under the sun is short, isn't it? So the preacher exhorts us to enjoy it, to receive it as a gift from God, including the work that God has given us to do. Now we've asked, how do we live in an unjust world? Now we want to ask, how do we live in an oppressive world? The preacher wrestles with the reality of oppression. Look at verse 1. Again, I saw all the oppressions that are done under the sun. Injustice and oppression are similar realities. It's hard to imagine any type of oppression that is not unjust. It is significant to us that Solomon recognizes all of the injustice and oppression around him under the sun. I think so many times people turn a blind eye to injustice and oppression. We don't see it. This is especially true, isn't it, when it doesn't affect us. One of the first things that comes to mind is the Holocaust. I'm sure you've heard the poem by Pastor Martin Niemöller. First they came for the communists, and I did not speak out because I was not a communist. Then they came for the socialists, and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. And they came for me, and there was no one left to speak out for me. Slavery and Jim Crow are the most glaring examples of injustice and oppression in American history. But we know there have been others as well. We know that President Roosevelt set up internment camps during World War II where people of Japanese descent, including U.S. citizens, were incarcerated in isolated camps, their only crime being that they were Japanese. Another glaring example of institutional injustice and oppression in America is the reality of abortion on demand. But even beyond those national injustices and acts of oppression, the reality is, brothers and sisters, there are countless smaller acts of injustice and oppression that take place around us every day. The equally qualified job applicant who's passed over because of the color of his skin. The oppressive boss who treats his employees like cogs in the machine rather than as human beings created in the image of God. The poor tenant who is extorted by the greedy landlord who refuses to provide appropriate living conditions despite being sure to cash the expensive rent check every month. Surely you can think of countless examples of injustice and oppression around us every day. Like Solomon, we don't have to squint too hard to see injustice and oppression all around us in this fallen world under the sun. The reality of injustice and oppression is a major theme throughout the Bible, and Solomon wrestles with this reality here in Ecclesiastes 4. The preacher also wrestles with the lack of comfort. Look at verse 1 again. He says, And behold, the tears of the oppressed, and they had no one to comfort them. The oppression is bad enough, but even worse, Solomon says, is that there is no comfort for the oppressed. We live in a fallen world. We expect injustice and oppression. But what an indictment this is on mankind that the oppressed suffer with no one to comfort them. It's not Solomon's point here in Ecclesiastes, but it's worth mentioning this morning that as the people of God, we have a responsibility to provide comfort to the oppressed. We do not have the option of turning a blind eye to the injustice and oppression faced by others. We cannot go on about our lives like nothing is happening while others suffer. God tells his people in Jeremiah 22, thus says the Lord, do justice and righteousness and deliver from the hand of the oppressor him who has been robbed. 
and do wrong or violence to the resident alien and do no wrong or violence to the resident alien, the fatherless and the widow, nor shed innocent blood in this place. The prophet Micah says that God's people are to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with our God. James wrote in the New Testament, religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. God clearly calls us to care for and comfort the oppressed. In our New Testament scripture reading this morning, Jesus rebuked the Pharisees for their lack of care for the oppressed. In fact, in many ways, they were actually the perpetrators of injustice and oppression. And here in Ecclesiastes, the preacher wrestles with the power of oppressors. Look again at verse 1. He says, on the side of the oppressors, there was power and there was no one to comfort them. This is the reality of oppression, isn't it? It happens because the one doing the oppressing is in a position of power. And this is the reality of life under the sun. This leads to the preacher then wrestling with the fortune of death. Look at verse 2. He says, And I thought the dead who are already dead more fortunate than the living who are still alive. Now maybe you hear that and you think, fortune of death? What are you talking about? That's exactly what he says, isn't it? And I thought the dead who were already dead more fortunate than the living who were still alive. Solomon looks at the injustice and oppression all around him under the sun, and he determines that it's better to be dead than alive. At least if you're dead, you no longer have to live in this world surrounded by injustice and oppression. This is similar to one of the things that we often say when someone dies. What do we say? Well, they're in a better place. As Christians, we know that there is a better place in this world, don't we? But we also know that not everyone of whom it is said they're in a better place is actually in a better place. Think about that for a minute. Despite all of the injustice and oppression of this world, if you are not in Christ, this life is as good as it gets. There is no better place awaiting you. Death is not more fortunate than life. But if you are in Christ, it is true that there is a better place awaiting you. An infinitely better place. Paul said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Let's not fool ourselves. Death is only gain for the believer. Those who are in Christ. Those who have turned from their sin and placed their trust in Jesus. The preacher wrestles with the fortune of death. And finally, the preacher wrestles with the misfortune of life. Look at verse 3. But better than both, is he who has not yet been been and has not seen the evil deeds that are done under the sun. Maybe you know someone who has said that they don't want to have any children because this world is such a terrible place. They don't want to bring a child into such a broken world. And that's kind of similar to what Solomon is saying here. Because of all the injustice and oppression in the world, Solomon says it's better not to be born. This reminds me of something Jesus said in Matthew 18. He said, but whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. Those who perpetrate injustice and oppression against God's people will experience his judgment. It would be better if they had a great millstone fastened around their neck and they were cast into the ocean. Jesus also said of Judas, he who has dipped his hand in the dish with me will betray me. The son of man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the son of man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. Notice that it's not the victims of injustice and oppression that Jesus says would be better off having not been born. Rather, it's the perpetrators of injustice and oppression. 
Victims experience God's care and comfort when they turn to him. Perpetrators experience God's judgment. We've seen Solomon wrestle with the questions, how do we live in an unjust world and how do we live in an oppressive world? One of the things that I love about the book of Ecclesiastes is that it meets us where we are and it helps us meet others where they are too. You see, we live in a world of trite and cliche answers to difficult questions. But the thing that I love about the book of Ecclesiastes is that Solomon doesn't do that here. He's not afraid of the hard questions. And he actually doesn't force himself to provide an answer to every question that he raises. He seems very comfortable allowing the difficulty of life under the sun to remain without trying to explain it away. I think this is helpful for us if we think about our own lives in this world. Life is hard, isn't it? There are so many challenges that we face. So many difficulties that we walk through. And, and Solomon gives us permission, brothers and sisters, to feel the difficulty of life. We don't always have to put a smile on our face when we don't feel like smiling. We can allow the difficulty of life to just be. But we can also allow the difficulty of life to drive us to God. How do we live in an unjust and oppressive world? Brothers and sisters, we trust God. He is the good and just one. We may still have a lot of questions about why things happen the way that they do. Why does God allow so much injustice and oppression? But we know that God is good. We know that he always does what is right. And as Christians, we know that one day he will make all things right. I think Ecclesiastes also helps us in our evangelism. You see, the people around us in the world are struggling with these same questions which, with which Solomon struggles in this text. How do we live in an unjust world? How do we live in an oppressive world? It seems that the answer some Christians want to give to these questions is to deny the reality of injustice and oppression. Friends, that kind of response is foolish and unbiblical, and it will not gain us a hearing with the lost world around us. The lost people around us already know that there is injustice and oppression in the world. They already know that this world is broken. They already know that this isn't how things should be. So if we come along acting like the world isn't broken, then they'll write us off and dismiss everything we have to say. Now, it is true that the world has a warped understanding of what injustice and oppression really is. Not everything that the world calls justice is actually just. For example, the world talks about reproductive justice. That's a fancy word for abortion. And abortion is a euphemism for killing a preborn baby in the womb. But when the world talks about so-called reproductive justice, that's an opportunity not to say justice is bad, but to talk about what justice actually is according to the Bible rather than dismiss the importance of justice. The book of Ecclesiastes gives us language for some of the things that we know and feel about the world. And some of the things that our neighbors feel and know about the world. Our study of Ecclesiastes gives us the opportunity not to withdraw, but to press in. And to meet our neighbors where they are so that we can show them the only just one who ever lived. The one who left his throne in heaven. The one who came to this earth, took on flesh and dwelt among us. The one who went to Calvary's cross and experienced the greatest act of injustice and oppression there ever was as he died to pay for our sin. The righteous son of God took our sin on himself and died in our place so that we can be made right with God. And through turning from our sin and placing our trust in Jesus, his righteousness is credited to our account. We are made new in Christ Jesus. 
and given the hope of eternal life with God in a new heaven and a new earth that is free from all injustice and oppression. That's the hope of the gospel in an unjust and oppressive world. That's the hope we need as we live life under the sun. It's the hope our neighbors need as well. And we be a people who hold out to them this hope, the hope that is only found in the Lord Jesus Christ.